Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host Mickey Dam, and today we're going to be talking about The Tenth Planet, written by Keith Palmer and Jerry Davis, directed by Derek Martison. Ah, I just hit my head! Woo, that really hurt. Right, anyway, so this story exists. Well, Parts 1, 2, and 3 do. Part 4 on this DVD is actually animated in that anime style that was used in The Reign of Terror. And just, just off the bat, it's a lot better here. The, the editing fits much perfectly. The animation is a lot more fluid and it really suits. Now, I for this marathon, I used the animated reconstruction, but I do also like the the VHS reconstruction with pictures and uh, little, like text descriptions. Um, I don't know if it's loose canon, it very well could be, but um, oddly enough the, the VHS reconstruction, which may or may not be loose canon, is actually um, a special feature on, on the second disc. So you can actually choose to watch ver which version you want of episode 4. So that's really cool. I like to, I like the mix of the matches. I, I don't mind either version um, here. Usually I pick like animation or I pick uh, reconstructions, but for this one I've decided I, I, I don't mind either version. So there you go. The Doctor and the crew land in the distant future of 1986. Um, in Antarctica where there's like an astronomical um, mission um, of astronauts, and we and we're in like like a space um, communications office place run by a military force. Now, it's important to thing to note here is uh, this starts the Doctor Who trend of the bus story. For those of you who don't know, bus is a to a story term, it means base under siege. And what that means is it's a story where our main characters, um, they find themselves in a situation where they're in a base, as the title suggests, and you have to befriend a small group of people. Whilst this is going on, a force, a alien force, or something where there is attacking them from all sides and so, there's very little room to uh, get out. Now, Doctor Who used the bus story a lot in the 60s, with this one being its first, its first um, time really using the format. And it, it was done mainly for budgetary region, because um, like, you, know, you only got a few amount of sets and you can use the same monsters, like a repeated monster. And the BBC do, especially in Lloyd, I can't remember how when his run ends during the Second Doctor era, but um, the bus formula really works for Doctor Who. Because we, as you know, our regulars are only consisted of at least, at most, four characters. And at the least, two, or maybe sometimes even one. So... With the bus story, it helps get us introduced to the surrounding characters quicker and it saves a lot of budget because Doctor Who is a show where uh, the sets are constantly changing apart from the TARDIS. I, come to think about it, I've just realised something. They've never done a bus story in the TARDIS. That would have been interesting. Somebody should make that. Maybe Chris Chibnall, who knows. But anyway. And yeah, this so this bus story becomes a regular thing in Doctor Who and... If you like bus stories, congratulations, you just hit the jackpot <laughs> for 60s Doctor Who is, is mainly known, especially the second Doctor era. And for some reason, it never feels stale. It always, I, I say it always works. The, the format always works, whether the story around it is a different thing. And here, I think it does work. Um, the villains of this story are a little monster a little known monster called the Cybermen, the greatest villains in sci-fi history. Um, so let me let me 
delve back. So the Doctor goes in to this, this base, the base that's under siege, and when the astronauts, the astronauts seem that their ship are like draining power from, getting their power drained from a new uh, satellite, a new planet, the 10th planet. Ah, yeah, see? And also, here's a fun fact. Um, if this was made now, it would have been the ninth planet, because Pluto doesn't count as a planet anymore. But during the 60s, when this was made, and 1986, when the story is set, uh, Pluto was considered a planet, so the tenth planet actually fits still. So, good job for future-proofing a, um, um, an alloy. And on this planet, um, Mondas, we have um, ships that come down. And another important thing to note, in these, one of the astronauts is played by a black actor, and this was seen very modern for its for its um, for its concept as a black astronaut was con was very unheard of back in the 1960s, and in fact, in the DVD uh, comment uh, not commentary on one of the DVD bonus features, the actress who plays um, Polly, brilliant actress, can't remember her name. I do apologise. That that sounds really bad, but she recalls an account where. William Hartnell and one of the other uh, crew member of the of the show were joking about about how how there was a um, black astronaut. So yeah, that's just something to note. But the guy who played the astronaut doesn't remember this, and he says that um, William Hart, if there was any um, racial distancing between him and William Hartnell, it was something that never. That he'd never saw anyway, so so William Hartnell treated him to his face anyway, uh, perfectly fine, but maybe behind his back. So a bit of drama behind the scenes there. Um, racism is bad, people. Don't do it. <laughs> that's that's the moral of the story. Um, but I'm getting off topic. Let's. Um, so the, the the ship, the astronaut ship, gets destroyed as the Cybermen land on Earth, and bef you, you, with the, the original the original Cybermen designs are a lot different to what we we are used to, even in classic who. They're a lot more fleshy than than later later versions. Like their hands are still human hands and. Their faces are just cloths with like their eyes like blackened out and and they got like those weird voices and they just look strange. And when I originally saw this story, I couldn't help but laugh. They looked really ridiculous. But the more I think about this story, the more I I rewatch it. Um it actually has become my favourite Cyberman design. And in certain scenes they are really creepy. There's a brilliant bit where Ben gets tr uh, stuck in a projection room and when this, that Cyberman walks up to him and smashes his hand on the table and it, it just comes up to him in the dark, it's absolutely terrifying. And those voices are one another thing where it's like it's really silly but then there's something about it which the more you listen to it, the more creepier it becomes. They got like a... Um, yeah, we're big. I'm like us, like like or like it's like somebody pretending to do auto tunes, and and there's a little like vibration, like um technical vibrations that they put onto the voice, and it does kind of give the impressions that these were once humans that have now become um, roboticized, and it touches that uncanny valley. My sister's is going on. Um, Back, back to our little form crew. Um, the leader of this base, he, he's very stiff upper lip, and uh, he's one of those characters where you either find him a bit bland and forgetful, or you, or you like him because of how the story sets him up as. And I personally like him. Um, later on in the story, they send another. Um, ship up 
to try and work out what's happening and trying to save the the other astronauts and that one is actually run by his son and so the stakes for him are put really high as um he comes up with as um as mondas is absorbing earth's energy and uh it's more likely that this ship could crash just like the other ship. So this guy, the runner, the guy who runs the base, he really wants to destroy Mondas as soon as possible. Now, it's also important to note that in episode three, William Hartnell isn't in it at all. Um, they just kind of explain it that the Doctor is really ill, and you only they only shoot the Doctor from behind, which is clearly somebody in a wig, and. They gave one of the lines to one of his lines to Ben that um, Mondas can't absorb all of Earth's energy and soon it will just self destruct by trying to absorb it all. And I really didn't like that explanation as if, like, if they did nothing, the problem would sort itself out. It kind of cheapened, cheapened it because now we, before we had this dilemma where it's like, we can either destroy Mondas now, as soon as possible, or let them basically absorb us. Uh, so it's either like us or them, and clear from the Cybermen's point of view, it's us or them. And from our human characters, it was us or them. But, uh, like, like, straight on, it's either we destroy them or they destroy us. But with this explanation, it's more... Um, it's either we destroy them, or we do nothing and they destroy themselves anyway. And so we basically should just do nothing. And I think that really weakened the, the later half of the story. So episode two and th four, uh, sorry, episodes three and four really drag, in my opinion, because of this. It's just a tiny explanation, but it does go a long, a long way. I just realised I haven't talked about Ben and Polly in this story. They, um, they keep the character traits from the smugglers. So you got um, Polly, who is the um, the optimistic, and you got Ben, who is like the pessimistic, and he's a bit more of um, a skeptic, whilst Polly's a believer, and they play off very well here. But again, they in terms of their pop they're part of the story they get very little to do and it's it is slightly becoming a trend at this moment that these companions are a bit weak in terms of the plot for episode for some of the episodes later on they do get bigger into the story but it's it's never then it's never thick enough of interest if that makes any sense but i don't uh like, like um, Ben basically convinces these two guys to work with him to stop the Cybermen. But there's nothing really hard-hitting or character-driven about it. He does have, Ben ha does have a character. It's just his character and what he does in the plot don't intertwine. And, and it just seems le like... This is what Ben um, is acts like and feels like and what he is. And then over here, is, this is what Ben is doing. He's stopping the Cybermen and making these friends. And they, but they never, it never clashes. It never has any repercussions of his character. So yeah, Ben and Polly here, like the smugglers aren't that well written. Um, the first Doctor gets some of the best lines of all time. Especially when um, Polly points out to the Cyberman, it's like, you have no feelings. And then um, the Cyberman is like, feelings? What is that? And the Doctor puts his hands on his collar and goes, Love, pride, hate, fear. Have you no emotions, sir? That is probably one of the most famous lines in in classic Doctor Who, uh, with the exception of the final speech to Susan. 
But man, William Hartnell just owns it and it's a great shame that this is his last story. Yeah, I haven't spoken about the fact that this is his last story um, a lot. And I that's mainly because the story has no focus. It has nothing to do with him leaving. Literally, like, his the whole aspect of him, like, changing is right at the very end of the story. And it, the story doesn't have actually anything to do with um, the change of um, the cast. So I'll, I'll, I'll get into that when, when the thing. So basically, the story becomes a race to stop this, this guy from using what is called the Z-bomb to destroy Mondas, which may also harm life on Earth. And it's basically, he's risking every all the world just to save his son. And that's that's really worked really well, this guy's character. And the guy who plays him, plays him very... I don't want to say over the top, because it makes you think, like, cheesy. Um, he, it is a bit more of like a caricature. But it does, it does really work. Like I said, stiff up the lip. Um, and so, basically, it's Ben, Polly, and these two other guys that they befriend, trying to delay it as much as possible, whilst Mondas basically destroys itself, which it does at the end, and they start um, fading, fading down. And that's how the Cybermen are destroyed, because they get their energy from Mondas. Bit of a weak, um, anticlimactic ending. It it just seems like right, the planet is destroyed. Um, all the Cybermen die as well. Just there you go. But like I said, it does work for the, this new character for this particular story, and and William Hartnell in part four. William Hartnell comes back and he basically stalls for time as he slowly is like, um, right, you, um, we will stop this bomb, we will, then, but take, and then he's like, tell everybody, he's like, take your time, basically, which is basically stalling them until their planet gets destroyed. And yeah, that's the 10th planet. Um, a great story, it's a bit, it drags a bit, um, a four part brilliant and now let's go on to what everybody really wants to talk about at the end of this story which is uh the regeneration like i said the story itself isn't actually about regeneration so could you imagine if a story like this came out today i mean at this point we didn't know anything about the doctor it was highly suggested he was human um, he referred to himself in hum as a human being in a few in a few stories, only that his plan the planet he's from is not Earth and it's from the future. So, how weird must it be then to see this character just change his face with no explanation? If this happened today, I mean, think about let's say, let's take Guardians of the Galaxy for example. Could you imagine if today, without any explanation, apart from the fact that he's um, an alien and this is how his body works, um, Drax suddenly became a different actor, was played by Jason Momoa out of no reason. People would go nuts. They're like, oh, it's destroying canon. Oh, you're, just, you're ruining the fan base. What about all those people who liked um, the first one. You're just ruining what was perfect. So if this came out, if this story came out today, it wouldn't, people would have absolutely hated it. I mean, the internet is just um, a kid's playroom at the end of the day. But this is the 1960s. They didn't have to worry about that. They just had the actor change for no reason. No explanation given. I mean, later on, in the second episode, in the next episode, we'll we'll delve into it. But here, it's not like somebody is like, right, I'm gonna change my face now. The doctor literally is like, um, this old body's mind is wearing a bit thin. He says in episode two or four, no, he says it in episode four, 
right uh, right after he be, um, gets better, and then when when everyone is safe and stuff, he says it's far from being all over, and then he's like, um, it's strange because you think everybody hears that and thinks right that's that's the first doctor's final words, but no, his final words are actually um, something along of line like um, yes, keep warm, keep warm. Something like that. And so um, the doctor goes in the TARDIS and he lies on the floor, collapses and he changes his face. He renewals, um, which was the term given when the story was made. Uh, regen the word regeneration won't come until uh, the 70s. So, th yeah, there you go. So the, the show just had to change. It had to it changed with its cast it changed with behind the scenes and the way it was written like before you used to have a huge amount of focus on pure historicals and and um the politics were more about like cultural but then when in Lloyd came in there was a whole focus on military and um technophobia oh i forgot to mention as well kit Kip Palmer, as you may were aware, he gave the idea for the war machines. And I said in that one, he he has a sort of like technophobia. Where there it's kind of like the fear of the internet, which wasn't a thing back then. Here it's like human advancements with the Cybermen or um, robots that have... The humans that had made themselves robots, basically. So there you go, his, his theme... His trademark is in this story. Um, but yeah. Um, what else can I say? But yeah, change had to happen. And the cast have changed. The stories have changed. So it was time to change our main cast. William Hartnell behind the scenes was getting very unwell. And he sort of got fired. Because, of, because he couldn't keep up with all the lines and stuff. And when asking about casting, the next casting in interviews, um, William Hartnell said, there was only one man in Britain who could take over the role, and that was Patrick Troughton. So I'll see you next time for The Power of the Daleks. And we say hello to the second incarnation of the Doctor. See you then on the Doctor Who Marathon.